Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the Wellfleet Community Forum. I'm Sheila Lyons. I am the uh, president of the forum. And uh, some of our board members are here, and they will be, um, some of them will be talking later on tonight about an update on what we're doing locally in our community on energy and, and coastal issues. But our main, main event tonight is that we have the Cape Cod Commission here with us. And um, they, they are going to be talking about a grant that was uh, given by NOAA. And they have been partnering with the Wakoit Center. And um, they did a, uh, a community engagement around um, coastal resiliency, gathering uh, different sections of the town, very much the way they, they uh, the way the 208 went, where you gather so many different towns together and start talking about the coastal issues in your town, how are you going to deal with these issues, what are the options of dealing with these issues, What's, what does the future hold for us, and how are we going to confront and adapt to that future. So they're here to present a lot of the information that was gathered, and hopefully a lot of it will be kind of focused on the uh, Outer Cape, as well as just the Cape in general, and in on, the, on the topic in general. And um, I saw this presented at a coastal conference um, back in November or um, December. And uh, it is an annual conference, and I do um, hope that you keep that in mind and look for it uh, in the future, because it's a very valuable thing to go to, and there's a lot of uh, great minds come together and tell about what's going on around the country and what's going, around, uh, going on around the state and locally and what, what our leaders and different departments are doing about it, the EPA and DEP and that sort of thing. So with that, I, um, they are going to be presenting. They can tell you the rules. I do think that they'll, they'll be able to take questions as they're going along. And um, I just really thank them for being here. I had a great relationship with the Cape Cod Commission. I have a lot of respect. And I think we should all be very proud and happy that we have the commission uh, as part of Cape Cod. So with that, who am I going to introduce first? So Heather McAleer is here, and then there will be Jennifer and Erin Perry. So they will all be taking over. And if anybody does have a question, I do ask you to come to the mic, state your name, and speak to the microphone, because we are recording this, and people will not be able to hear your question. So with that, I thank you, and I'm going to hand it over. All right. Hi, um, I'm Heather McElroy, I'm Natural Resource Specialist at the Cape Cod Commission, and uh, I'm going to sort of kick off our presentation here this evening. Very happy to be in Wellfleet this evening. Um, we are going to talk about the Resilient Cape Cod Project, um, but we thought that we might uh, just open this presentation with a little review of some local planning. Um, Wellfleet uh, conducted its hazard mitigation planning process um, a couple years back, uh, you have a certified hazard mitigation plan certified by um, the state. The certification is good for five years, um, and having a certified hazard mitigation plan um, makes you eligible for a variety of, of grants that can help improve the, the town's um, hazard preparedness, really. Um, there were a number of people who participated in this planning process in town, um, many of your town staff, um, as well as uh, staff from the Cape Cod Commission assisted in the preparation of the plan. But we introduce it because um, part of relevant to this, our topic this evening, um, because uh, the um, hazard planning process is really uh, centered around trying to talk about the hazards that your community faces. And um, MEMA, uh, Mass Emergency Management Agency, um, as a subset of FEMA, um, requires that when you go through the hazard mitigation planning process, you look at and consider and discuss all of these potential threats to your community. So through that uh, planning process, Wellfleet settled on these uh, seven, eight, um, seven, um, 
threats as the ones that were really most significant for the community to think about, consider, and, and plan for. Recognizing that maybe some of the others, like thunderstorms, are things that certainly you, you have here, but it's less threatening than some of the others. Um, of those, um, the uh, NOAA um, Resilient Cape Cod project um, has focused on these, these three hazards, and I'm going to just get into those in a little bit more detail here. Um, so what, how do we sort of translate the threat into um, some figures that are sort of um, you can actually connect with? 19% um, of, of Cape Cod is located within the FEMA special flood hazard area, or basically flood zones, what you probably have heard of as flood zones. Um, within that area, $28.8 billion worth of um, property, assessed property value. That's really a lot of value and represents a um, significant portion of our municipal tax base as well. Here in Wellfleet, um, that assessed value of all structures in the flood hazard area is $376 million. So again, thinking about how that supports your local tax base is um, something to keep in mind when we're planning for these, these threats. So <clears throat> this is just, uh, I'm just going to walk through, um, just touch on some of, the, some of these threats and, and try to illustrate them for you. This is a snapshot of your harbor area. Um, and I think probably most of you are familiar with this. I don't need to orient you to it. Okay. So, um, but the blue is, uh, is that mapped 100-year um, floodplain, um, which means that properties located within that area are um, potentially more vulnerable to flooding and also are subject to um, the flood insurance requirements. This is a, um, a viewer that the USGS um, puts out that is a, is a great tool for illustrating erosion rates. So erosion is another one of those, um, those hazards, coastal hazards that we face and we're planning for. Um, what we're seeing here, sort of running from hot to cold, uh, are erosion, long-term erosion rates in the town of Wellfleet. So the yellow is, is indicating that there's sort of a modest amount of erosion over the very long term. Red indicating that there's um, a significant amount of erosion happening over the long term, greater than two feet per year. This shows the short-term erosion rates. So this may be more reflective of what you are observing along your shoreline at the present time. Um, there are some hot spots, clearly. Um, and in general, there are few places where sediment is actually accreting. Um, those are the, the blue or the green um, spots on the map. <clears throat> um, sea level rise is another one of those threats that we're um, planning for in, in this project. Um, this graph helps illustrate uh, potential sea level rise that we might see under different scenarios and over different periods of time. So I think that, you know, th without getting too much into the weeds here, the numbers down here run from 2020 up to 2100 and from zero feet to 10 feet. You know, the big picture here is that um, depending on what kind of scenario plays out, uh, what kind of um, swelling and rising of the seas play out over time, um, we could see between 4 and 10 feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. And just to make that a little bit more accessible, by 2050, in 30 years, um, we could have, worst case scenario, maybe 3 feet of sea level rise. This is a, um, a snapshot of a viewer, a tool that our GIS, the Cape Cod Commission's um, GIS department has put together. Um, we can provide you with a, a link to it if you're curious. Um, it allows you to turn various layers on and off, um, but uh, I think what's um, sort of most telling here are, is the, uh, the ability here when it's live, you can select your sea level rise number basically. It's at zero feet right now. 
And if you set it up to two feet, then you begin to see um, the change in um, where floodwaters are coming in, or just tide, not, not storm-related flooding. Um, that change from, from um, sort of conditions as they are today to increased um, flooding, regular inundation based on um, tidal conditions. The yellow dots show some of um, your identified um, critical facilities in your community. Again, those were critical facilities identified through your hazard mitigation planning process. And the red squiggly lines are um, some of the roads in Wellfleet that become cut off due to that two feet of uh, new um, tidal height. And then we can sort of um, scroll through um, four feet of sea level rise and six. Now, that shows actually all of the roads in Wellfleet um, <laughs> being cut off which is actually just reflective, not that literally every road would be underwater um, uh, under six feet of sea level rise, but that the rotary in Orleans gets inundated and thus the outer cape is cut off uh, from access. So yeah, something to keep in mind. <laughs> Get your boats ready. Um, so how are we vulnerable? Um, these were just some of the questions that we threw out during our um, stakeholder uh, engagement process, which uh, Sheila touched on and Aaron is going to um, discuss in a little bit of more detail as well. Um, but there are lots of ways. You know, the immediate thing that you can think of when we're in a storm situation is damage to buildings and roads. Um, but you can have permanent flooding in, with sea level rise and loss of access. Um, impacts to some of your critical facilities. That same sea level rise viewer that I showed you has the, your critical facilities located, identified with yellow dots. In other parts of the Cape, those yet do, yellow dots go to red dots where the critical facility is affected by the, the sea level rise. Fortunately, it seems that's not so much of an issue in Wellfleet. But you can also have damaged wells, private wells, um, and septic systems, and I have some images just to help illustrate that. Um, and then there's also emergency response during and after storms, which is a consideration, um, and the degraded environment from storm damage. So that sort of you know, tells its own story. I think this is what people often think of about, you know, uh, one of the threats is, you know, how is it going to affect my personal property? Um, but this is maybe a more a less obvious one, but a very significant one, is the impact to wells. Um, you know, as sea level rises, the salt water, not only is salt water coming further inland, but it's also putting more pressure on our, on our underwater um, water supplies, on our aquifer. And so that can actually um, create problems with wells that are located close to that um, fresh salt water interface. Similarly, um, septic systems that are located, uh, you know, not far above the water table and that may um, feel some pressure from sea level rise, there, there's the sea level rise, may fail because that separation is no longer there under a, um, a different sea level rise scenario. And then, of course, there are the threats to the environment, which, you know, there's the aesthetics, which is, is disturbing, but um, also in terms of all of the, the benefits that we derive from a healthy functioning environment, like flood storage capacity, um, uh, filtering of um, pollutants, and um, habitat, et cetera, are all impacted by the effects of basically damage to human-built structures um, on the environment. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron Perry, who's going to get into the details of the project. Thank you. 
Thanks, Heather. Um, so in response to uh, a lot of the uh, information on the hazards that Heather outlined for you, um, back in 2015, the commission and a number of partner agencies uh, applied for a grant, uh, as Sheila mentioned, through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It was a regional uh, coastal resiliency grant program. Um, we were awarded uh, the grant. It's a three-year project. Our partners include the Bacoit Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve, uh, the Association of Preserved Cape Cod, um, and also the town of Barnstable, which I'll touch on in just a minute. Um, we had a lot of support um, from our state agencies and a number of other partners, including uh, Woods Hole Sea Grant, uh, the Center for Coastal Studies up in Provincetown, um, and the Mass um, Coastal Zone Management Agency. Um, you know, and I think that was really key. So this was a very competitive grant process, um, but I think NOAA recognized um, kind of the, uh, the critical needs here uh, in the region, and we were one of five grants awarded nationwide. And so the support from all those partners was critical uh, in obtaining the grant. Uh, and the point of this was really to investigate the environmental and the socioeconomic effects of local and regional coastal resiliency strategies. And so all of what Heather um, outlined, you know, not only the damage to our buildings and our infrastructure, but the damage um, and the concerns over the impacts to the natural environment and how that affects life on Cape Cod. Uh, we are in the third year now of the project. Uh, we are uh, going to be wrapping up in June. The final piece of the project is the, the pilot project with the town of Barnstable. So as I mentioned, they're, they're a key partner on this effort. Uh, we'll be taking uh, the resources developed uh, as part of this project, which I, I will touch on and, and Jen will touch on um, today, uh, as well as the um, kind of regional uh, engagement process that we used and utilizing that uh, in a local context to right, help the town of Barnstable identify some solutions um, to address some of the hazards that they're dealing with. And so just to outline a little bit the phases of the project, um, again, it was a three-year grant and the phases kind of break down the same way. So the first year, the first phase was really about data collection and developing a, a database of adaptation strategies. Uh, we worked closely with Association to Preserve Cape Cod on this. They did a lot of this research uh, and we've developed a database. Again, I'll touch on that and show you some of the products developed. Um, uh, for the database and the different strategies that we, we took a look at. The second phase uh, was really kind of year two of the project was the public engagement uh, phase and some of the socioeconomic analysis um, that we did to feed a decision support tool um, that Jen will touch on and that was really the third phase of the project. Over the last year or so we've worked with a developer, we've taken um, all of the data and information that we gathered in the first couple of phases and the information that we got from you all and other stakeholders across the region um, and we worked to develop a web-based decision support tool that can be used in, in local planning processes. And so just kind of to step through each one, I'll, I'll touch briefly on the adaptation strategies. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we developed a database of strategies, and they really um, comprise a wide range of different um, approaches that communities can take to address erosion, sea level rise, and flooding and storm surge. Um, and they range from strategies that seek to protect uh, the infrastructure and the buildings and the resources we have along the coast. Um, so those might be things like uh, revetments or seawalls or other other infrastructure that can protect um, can protect the built environment along along the shore. Strategies that seek to accommodate um, the kind of changing conditions really uh, focus on uh, kind of adjusting our development to accommodate the hazard. And finally. Um, you know, strategies that really uh, don't make an attempt to address the hazard uh, really, um, you know, just kind of retreat, um, you know, move away from it and um, move buildings and infrastructure away from areas where they can be impacted. So these are things like managed retreat, um, other policy related options. Um, so those are, those are kind of the range of things that we've looked at. We've tried to categorize them in a number of ways. Um, and really the, the strategies database um, comprises uh, also a range of both nature-based solutions and structural solutions, um, as well as a uh, solutions that are a combination of both. They have a nature-based component, but potentially a, a little bit of um, a harder infrastructure component. Um, and then there are a number of policy options. So there's 45 strategies in the database. Um, and again, we did try to categorize them in different ways. You can see along the top here, this is a fact sheet for one particular approach included in the database. Along the top here, you see that you know managed relocation is categorized as retreat. 
Uh, we've also tried to identify the scale at which the strategy can applied. Some uh, can be applied. Some are more of a neighborhood scale. Something like managed retreat could be applied um, across a community or a segment of a community, so at a larger scale. Um, and then we've included a description of the strategy, um, the climate hazards uh, that that strategy may address. It may be one uh, or two or all of the um, hazards addressed by the Resilient Cape Cod project. And then there's additional information relative to permittability uh, in the state, other benefits provided, um, and then uh, where we've been able to, we include, um, you know, an example that's specific to Cape Cod, a, a place in the region where this has potentially been implemented. Oh, sure. So this is an example. Um, so this is a, a location along the Brewster shoreline, Breakwater Landing Beach. Um, it's an example of managed relocation. They moved the parking lot back from the coastline. And so um, the gray area here um, shows where the parking lot was prior to uh, the relocation. And this is the, the area of um, the new parking lot. So the second phase of this project was really focused on stakeholder engagement. Uh, we went through a regional process. I know many of you uh, attended some of our stakeholder meetings. Um, and we really tried to focus on engaging participants across the entire Cape, um, but really based on their connection to the water that surrounds, uh, surrounds the region. And so those of you that have been involved in other processes that we've um, taken on, something like the 208 process, uh, we broke up into subregions. This took a little bit of a different approach, really focused on the, the segments of shoreline. Um, and so in many cases, or in all cases really, uh, each stakeholder group um, had a number of different communities participating in it. Um, we, you know, we were really seeking to not only provide information to the community, um, but perhaps more importantly, really get information and feedback back um, from all of the stakeholders that participated that would help shape the project, help better identify um, how the project can assist in developing local strategies. Um, so it was, a, it was a give and take throughout the entire process. We went through a number of meetings. Um, actually, quickly, I'll just touch on the Wellfleet participation. Um, we had a number of people participate from Wellfleet in the Outer Cape group, including town staff and elected officials, um, members of the Conservation Trust, uh, members of the Community Forum, I recognize a number of you here, um, the Natural Resources Advisory Board, as well as the Friends of Herring River. So I do apologize if I missed anybody. Um, but uh, we had a, a, you know, a large contingent from the community and the Outer Cape in general. It was one of our most well-attended uh, stakeholder groups. We had. Um, a large group and consistent participation over the course of three meetings. So it was not a, a small commitment. Uh, we held three meetings over the course of um, about three months. Uh, each meeting was several hours long, and so it was, it was a real commitment for part people to participate. Um, starting in December, we talked about um, kind of coastal vul vulnerability, a lot of what Heather covered for you in this presentation um, in a little bit more detail so that those that were participating could better understand um, some of the hazards that were impacting their communities um, and could provide additional information or um, experiences that they've had locally. The second meeting was really on the adaptation strategies database um, and some of what um, the communities involved in the process and, and um, in each of the individual stakeholder groups value. Uh, so really trying to focus on kind of what they'd like their shoreline to look like in the future and some of the strategies um, that might make more sense for their communities or that they might be more interested or concerned about. The third meeting was really focused on action. And um, here, uh, what we did is take a kind of a mock-up of the decision support tool that we will share with you in a minute. Um, and we looked for feedback on the functionality of that tool, um, how useful it would be to the community, um, and anywhere that there could be improvements uh, made to it prior to um, contracting with the developer to actually implement the, the tool. And so a quick example of one of the resources that we use during the stakeholder process and that we continue to use and that um, a lot of value has been added um, by you all and others across the region is a story map that was created to um, kind of track local stories of coastal impacts. And so this was a way to really start to capture some of the local experiences um, that uh, stakeholders and others have had uh, relative to erosion, sea level rise, uh, and flooding in their communities and start to tell that regional story. Um, and so, you know, that, that really 
really helps us to better understand, um, you know, how people are being impacted by uh, some of the issues addressed by this project. And so I'll just quickly kind of show you some of the functionality. This is, um, you know, you can interact with the map, uh, you can kind of zoom in and out, you can select an area. So here, you know, we're clicked on this Nauset uh, beach area and it's providing an example of overwash um, at a new path that occurred in the last um, uh, March, is, uh, one, of the, one of March's storms this past year. And zoom in a little bit closer, you can look at examples specific to Wellfleet. And so here is an example of high water um, at the Commercial Street Dyke at Mayo Creek. Again, another um, impact that was uh, seen in the March storm. And these um, examples were provided by stakeholders during the process. You can see up here there's a participate button. Um, anybody can go to the story map. Um, click on the participate button, upload their own photo, um, add a sentence or two about what they experienced there, and we'll it, it will be um, kind of automatically captured on that story map. And so quickly, um, and we can share this presentation with you, but there is a short link there to the story map. Um, we're also using this uh, with communities as we work with them on the municipal vulnerability preparedness um, process. And so Jen's going to cover that a little bit. Um, but it's being used in other efforts as we move forward, so we'd like to continue to populate it. And with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Jennifer Clinton. She's a special projects coordinator at the commission, has, has been really focused on integrating all of the resources developed for the project into this decision support tool and working with a lot of the GIS and development staff. So hi, everybody. I'm going to step you through the tool. Um, I wanted to say thank you to Sheila for inviting us here, by the way. I did get to step through this um, tool for the first time at Coastal Conference, so it was um, very exciting for me to share it, and I, I'm happy I continued to do so. So the commission worked with a developer, uh, de um, I guess we can call them a developer. Their, their name is the Timmins Group. They're based in Virginia, um, and they have experience in incorporating GIS data with um, these environmental vulnerabilities. So it was a great uh, collaboration with them and our GIS team. Um, so the first thing you see when you open the tool, the Cape Cod Coastal Planner, is an aerial map of the Cape. Um, you'll have a welcome panel that will have a tutorial to step you through it. There will be um, information on how to use the tool. One thing that we do want everybody to keep in mind is that we don't want anyone to consider this an engineering tool. This isn't something that you can necessarily, you know, decide 100% <laughs> this is the, the perfect thing to use um, in front of my house, for example. We do want to be able to compare and understand the trade-offs between our different adaptation strategies, so that's the level we're hoping that we can use this tool at. So the first thing you're going to do on the aerial map, you're going to select your shoreline location. And these are based off the littoral cells on Cape Cod. So littoral cells are um, pathways for sand movement. But because um, erosion isn't the only issue we're addressing, we, we have referred to those as shoreline locations. And once you've selected your shoreline location, this is uh, Sandy Neck. We have a set of planning layers that people can turn on and off that can help you better understand what is on the ground um, underneath. Um, what the red line is, is our vulnerability ribbon, and I'll address that in a second. So some of the planning layers that people might be interested in include our infrastructure, the sewer infrastructure that's in the area, what are the public and private roads there, um, the areas of critical environmental concern and rare habitat, um, as well as historic properties and districts of critical planning concern. Uh, sea level rise, we're, we're able to sort of integrate that sea level rise viewer that we showed you earlier, and you can see two feet up to six feet, and then associated with that what the disconnected roads might be. Uh, we also have information on uh, coastal erosion, sediment transport, and the historic shoreline positions, as well as uh, the storm surge, the FEMA flood zones. So I, I mentioned the vulnerability ribbon, so that... Uh, step back. The vulnerability ribbon um, was a new creation the commission came up with based on a project that took place in South Carolina. It's called the South Carolina Beach Vulnerability Index and they looked at all of those planning layers um, and tried to sort of come up with a, a gradient scale low to high for how vulnerable these areas of shoreline are. So this would be if there are critical infrastructure or um, there were a lot of residences in the area that would be a higher vulnerability and if there was particularly vulnerable um, habitat we would make sure that that was included in, as well. 
So the blue segment um, shows which area was selected by the, the user. So you can click on what we're calling a zone of impact. So what area are you interested in protecting, accommodating, or um, retreating from? And you can select up to 4,000 um, feet. So this is like a pretty broad scale um, implementation project, but I think the minimum was 500 feet. So you select your segments of the vulnerability ribbon and then you add your strategy. And once you do that, this is, um, we're calling this the adaptation strategies panel. So you can see in the top left corner, it says erosion. And here you can um, change between erosion, vulner um, vulnerability to sea level rise, and then to storm surge. So depending on what hazard you're interested in planning for, that will change the list of available strategies which are um, in the list underneath. So every strategy, you can decide to do nothing. So they've all had this no action, or we were originally calling it the do nothing um, option. <laughs> and then we started planning meetings, and we said this is the do nothing meeting, and we realized how bad that looked. So <laughs> now it's no action. Um, so we have a list of uh, strategies that are associated with each of those hazards. And you can see some of the lists are grayed out. And it says NA for selection. So that means that what is ever on the ground underneath that vulnerability ribbon says that that makes it not a good match. Even if it could address erosion, you can't create a dune on um, an area that there's no beach, for example. So it does take into account what's already there. So this is storm surge. This gives you undevelopment, so removing the development that exists, open space protection, and salt marsh restoration for this particular area in Sandy Neck. Um, and then additional information um, on each of these strategies includes everything that was built into the adaptation strategies matrix. So this is where the APCC work really came in, um, helping us understand what each um, strategy could address in terms of hazards, the benefits provided, um, so what sort of ecosystem services might be impacted by these strategies, including habitat and water quality, the short description, advantages and disadvantages. So it's sort of like a quick, what is, you know, what considerations do I need when I'm making a decision about this um, in my area? So now you click apply strategy, and what pops up is this output panel. And this will give you a very quick comparison between the long-term impacts um, of your adaptation strategy. So in this example, we selected salt marsh. And this will show you the cost of um, the infrastructure that's in that area. So if it's in blue, that's a positive. And if it's in yellow, that's sort of a negative. So in this example, we're saying because we chose to do a salt marsh restoration, then the impacts of um, erosion aren't going to affect the infrastructure so much. So there's $25 million of private shoreline that could have been impacted over a 40-year time span. But now, because we chose to make an investment in that salt marsh restoration, that we were able to sort of avoid that loss or avoid damage to that area. And then. Um, there's a little gray tab right next to it, no action. So you can always click right back and forth between the adaptation strategy you chose and choosing no action. So you can see the comparison. If I did nothing, I would have potentially lost or impacted that 25 million. But because we made that investment, it's now protected. Do I have any questions now? I often get many. <laughs> um, do you want to come to the microphone? Wilson, um, I'm interested. Can you hear me? Is yes, on? I think so. I'm interested why you didn't choose a section of Wellfleet to show us this because, in fact, there is a burning issue, and it would have been nice to see this applied to the burning issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there a reason you chose not to? We haven't hit go yet on the um, tool. It's not officially public. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, we certainly can share it. Is this this is still on? Did I unplug this? <laughs> I can just try to talk really loudly. <laughs> work. Hello? Um, just. 
Hello? It's good. It is good. No worries. Okay. Um, so, yes, we have not officially published the link yet, but we um, have a couple design tweaks that we need to clean up a little bit of um, clean up a little bit of the output panel, and then we will be able to share that with everybody. So I actually, um, I have a notebook where I was gonna ask if anybody wants more information or wants to know when this goes live, I'll leave it up here and you can sign up and we can um, share that with you as soon as it's ready. So now that we have this wonderful tool, we want to make sure that we use it. <laughs> so that we've been looking for ways um, to integrate it into the local decision making. And one way that we're going to do that was with the Town of Barnstable pilot project that we mentioned. So the third, the fourth and final component of this um, project is going to be a pilot project with the town to sort of look at particular areas of shoreline and then test the tool out so they can see these trade-offs between the different adaptation strategies available to them. We're going to have, have a workshop um, where we are able to define the potential damage to certain properties, and then we can test that tool to look at potential losses and identify potential solutions. Um, and then this is going to follow up with the MVP process. So the state is doing um, MVP process, the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Project. And it's a way to sort of engage different communities in resilience planning. Um, and in case you don't know, 20, in 2018, Wellfleet did get a planning grant. And uh, next month, I believe it is, March 12th, they're going to be working, um, there's going to be a workshop on the MVP process. So if there is anybody interested in participating or attending that meeting, um, please contact Hillary Lamos. She's the town conservation agent. Um, and there will be, uh, Hillary Lamos, the ta she's a conservation agent, right? Yeah. Board of Health. Yes, also on the Board of Health. Say that again. Uh, she is with the Board of Health <laughs> and conservation. <laughs> um, so yes, if you're interested in, in, in participating in that workshop, it will be on March 12th. And um, once the town goes through the planning grant process, they will be eligible for what's called MVP action grants. So through the planning process, you'll be able to identify these hotspot areas, as you mentioned, and areas that um, may be more vulnerable to the things mentioned in the hazard mitigation plan. And then there are these MVP action grants available that um, are eligible to these communities after going through the MVP process. Um, and they are available for funding for particular projects that will address the identified vulnerabilities. Um, the state identifies a match of at least 25% of the total project cost um, on the town. So there is a bit of a cost sharing project. But. So that was the Resilient Cape Cod project. Um, we are all available for questions. So if there's anything that you want to know um, about this planning process or MVP, please let us know. This looks like a great um, discussion of adaptation, but did you, and I don't see it anywhere here, but I'm sure that was intentional, there's also mitigation, which is preventing or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Adaptation is responding to things that are gonna happen no matter what we do. So how would you, could you talk a little bit about including uh, mitigation when we think about being resilient. Sure. Sure. Well, so um, the Resilient Cape Cod project really was designed as um, an adaptation related project, right? So we're giving you an overview to that project, and that's um, why we didn't get into mitigation. Um, in, but of course, you know, you make an excellent point. Part of the reason that we're in this position today is because, you know, sea level is rising, climate is changing, and we're all experiencing the threats, the increased threats associated with those hazards. Um, going forward, um, so 
One thing we thought about whether we would try to touch on this evening was uh, the new regional policy plan, which was um, just uh, adopted by the Assembly of Delegates and signed by the county commissioners at the end of January. Um, and we thought, eh, that's gonna be too much to two overall in one evening. Um, but we can get into uh, some discussion on that if that's of interest, yes. definitely. Um, so through, through the uh, sort of extensive hearing process on the regional policy plan, which short story for those who may not be aware, Cape Cod Commission is responsible for preparing a regional policy plan every five years. Uh, we're a little overdue, and um, we've just completed um, our uh, 2018 update to the regional policy plan, um, a complete overhaul, which is why it took us a while. Um, so during that, the hearing process on the draft regional policy plan, we heard from a lot of folks who were really very interested um, in uh, the ability of the plan to address mitigation of um, the effects of climate change. And we made a number of changes to the plan to reflect those comments that we heard. Um, we have um, much stronger language throughout, you know, it's just basically, you know, touching on the fact that climate change is a thing and we need to be working to address it um, throughout the plan. Um, we also made some modifications to our goals and objectives that better address um, those concerns. And we added specific action items. So coming around to the, what are you gonna do about it? Um, some of the, the action items that we've identified, um, and again, this is a, the plan is designed to be for the next five years. Um, so some things that we thought that were reasonable for us to be able to accomplish in, in that time horizon include um, uh, a greenhouse gas inventory for the entire region. Um, there are some models available. We, we toyed with this earlier and thought, mm, didn't feel we wanted to go there because we didn't think we could do a good enough job. But there are some models that seem that um, we feel confident that we can provide something that will be meaningful as a as a way to sort of set a baseline. Where what are um, the greenhouse gas emissions? Where are the biggest areas that the biggest um, impacts are coming from? And then we can begin understanding that. Then we can begin to develop strategies for addressing those um, uh, sources. Uh, we also have some screening projects for identifying. Um, uh, potential solar um, facilities across the Cape. We want to look at, um, try to identify areas that are preferred for solar, large-scale solar development as opposed to others, um, as well as sites for EV charging stations. Um, and what else am I? Those are our immediate action items. Yeah. Um, and then I'll also note that during the, um, as I mentioned, during the hearing process for the adoption of the, the policy plan, um, a number of folks raised their concern that we were not going far enough with these additions. And um, part of this process was, um, part of these comments were made during the hearing at the Assembly of Delegates, the county's legislative body. and. The delegates um, heard that, and a couple of them um, proposed uh, some kind of task force working group to look at ways that the county can actually address climate change mitigation um, in additional ways that are sort of more um, uh, more immediate. So I know there's a draft. Um, ordinance that's a couple drafts, I think, ordinances that are um, in development presently. That's work of the assembly. And, uh, but we, Cape Cod Commission would likely be involved in that as well as other county departments as, and potentially others. Do you wanna jump in? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the other thing uh, 
for those of you that aren't maybe familiar with the regional policy plan, is the, the regional policy plan identifies a number of place types across the region, um, really trying to look at what exists here on the Cape and how we can um, further the kind of visions for those types of areas. Um, and the growth policy really focuses on um, looking at centers of existing activity that have um, business uh, and good form um, and really are areas that might be, you know, with adequate infrastructure might be locations for additional development. And so part of what that does is continue to focus on preserving our natural resources um, and the, you know, the, the resources that are part of the process to kind of sequester some of that carbon and, and help us um, as we move forward um, in addressing some of our climate change issues. So I just wanted to touch on that. The place types are a, um, a a very new element uh, to our regional policy plan. It's something we haven't done before, um, but I think is um, you know not only important to thinking about how we want to to grow, but also the areas that we want to preserve um, across the region. Um, I have my shellfish regulatory board hat on. And I happen to know that our component, the, uh, our submission included uh, an indication of how much farmland we have, which is to say aquaculture, not to mention the wild habitat. That was in our, you know, the thing, the FEMA hazard oh, yes, thing, oh, right? I'm sorry, I thought you were yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't had supper. So <laughs> here's my question. When you showed us the map with Wellfleet, right, I saw no indication of those areas where, which are all very known and available and were indicated in the submission. I saw, yeah, okay, uh, no, go back to the, yeah. Okay, so there and going down into South Wellfleet, there are huge numbers of grants of aquaculture and did any of your looking at Wellfleet include impacts on that? In other words, sea level is going to rise, and what is that going to do? What is that going to do to our tidal flushing rate, and which changes, you know, at different times of the year, and? So there's going to be more water coming up farther onto the land. But how is that going to change, if at all, how much bottom, like bottom, which is where the farms are, how much is that going to change how much of that is exposed or not? Did, I'm not saying you should have. Like, I'm not shaking my finger at you. But given that this is a very specific thing to Wellfleet, and by the way, to Barnstable, they have quite a bit. They don't have as much as we do. But, um, or maybe they do now, but I don't think so. But was that looked at? And if it wasn't, would you please do that? Because, you know, it's not just buildings that count. This is actually, in a sense, infrastructure. The farming structures on the grants are, you know, uh, they're as important as, say, some of our town buildings. Go ahead, Sheila. Well, I just want to point out, and I agree with you, and I think <laughs> if, I'm seeing, if I'm seeing this map right, um, a lot of the town is underwater. <laughs> yes. Right. So there, there's the road going along to Mayo Beach, uh, the pier. Um, you know, I, I think that it's almost evident of what's going to happen in general on a large scale on top of the the shellfish beds are also going to be impacted as well as all of that area in blue mm -hmm. if we don't think about how how we're going to do this and you know I understand mitigation but we do see that this, I mean, just from your first, pan, your first um, slide of the rate of predicted melting, and it's, it's becoming more and more rapid, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, it's a very sad tale. It's a very sad tale of how uh, we've been 
lied to and manipulated and distracted and made, uh, you know, and we all fell into a conversation, is it climate change or is it man-made? The problem is it's there and it's real and uh, it's happening and we've done nothing about it since, um, you know, since the great first Earth Day when we all thought we were very enlightened and said we, we recognize our folly here, we're going to do something about it, and then those people who had a monetary interest of nothing happening uh, changed the game. So um, this, I, in many ways, we're left with adaptation. We can mitigate as much as we want, but um, it's, it's almost a little, it, it not, it's not to say that we shouldn't, because if we don't, uh, who knows, there could be a chance that, you know, we still have, we can reduce this. But this is a very sad and scary tale. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I have concern about the, the shell beds, but it's, it's everything along with it. I mean, it's kind of obvious where, what's going to happen. And it, it kind of speaks for itself. So, I mean, that's just a comment, and it's the reality of this photo. And, um, you know, it's, it's not a happy happy thing. No. And I, yeah. I did want to, um, the first thing I wanted to say that this particular map was not generated by the commission. This is a federal um, FEMA flood map. So this is FEMA looking at um, storms that the intensity is so great that we, we called it the 100 year flood because we at the time thought we would see them every 100 years. But unfortunately, those are happening more often now. So, um, FEMA put this map together to create to sort of show what the special flood hazard area is. So that's the only thing reflected in this map is what they're trying to say is this is the extent of flooding you can expect for the maximum impact storm. Um, so we're not intending to leave anything off or you know ignore any particular facets of what's going to get impacted in Wellfleet. These, if you can look at these um, panels nationwide, and see this um, impact scale. Just say um, one thing about the commission. A lot of um, what their their uh, mandate is is to look at new development and to protect open space. And what is new development going to look like? Where is it being built? Is it being built in um, in areas that it's going to have an impact, a negative impact on the environment? And if it is new, you know. And I've been through a lot of the hearings with the commission where you are. Uh, dealing with the mitigation of a development, either the grading of it or moving it in a different location, um, how they're heating now that there's more requirements, they can, uh, you know, put down guidelines or thresholds of generating, self-generating energy to be more energy efficient buildings. That is really where, um, that, that's why one of the reasons it was cr created because things were being developed out of hand. And the only thing that's wrong with the Cape Cod Commission is it had no say over uh, residential development. <laughs> but um, theirs was to, was to uh, keep a handle on the commercial development. So I, I do uh, applaud that you're venturing into the climate mitigation area, but it wasn't necessarily your ballywick and your mandate. And I think that they have done uh, as much as they can, and all they can do is, is recommend and do thresholds with some regulation, but, you know, they're not um, the federal government, unfortunately, so, which has a bigger hammer that can be swung if it wants to be. So I just want people to keep in mind um, how far the commission can go, and I think that by um, venturing into this, this new sort of uh, need, uh, it will get better as they, as you can sort of maybe make the argument that that should be part of uh, your, you know, a, a real basic plan of the regional plan. But I think a lot of people who were looking at this regional plan were asking for something that was not necessarily uh, in their ability or in their calling. So I just want to explain that on behalf of people because I know that a lot of people felt that it didn't go far enough. And, you know, um, I think that the fact that, that it even exists for, for what it, for what it can do uh, is makes it lucky for us. And um, that's just where it's going. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for those comments, Sheila. I think 
that's um, very fair. Um, just putting up this graphic, this are part of the slides that we sort of decided late would be too much to get into, but on the regional policy plan, and Aaron touched on this, but it, it ties back around to Sheila's comments about you know why the commission was created initially. Um, this is a new concept that is incorporated into the new regional policy plan called Cape Cod Place Types, um, which um, was incorporated into the plan uh, in part recognizing that our communities across the region um, are very different. You know, town to town, they're very different. And then within a community, you have different kinds of place types. And so there are eight place types that range from natural areas to sort of you know, higher activity um, areas, you know, community activity centers, industrial activity centers, and military transportation areas, you know, those higher intensity uses, um, sort of on a gradient to some extent there. Um, but the point, just to reinforce the point that um, does get to this mitigation adaptation dilemma in some ways, um, Part of what the Cape Cod Commission has been trying to do for a long time is to preserve our natural areas and try to concentrate direct growth into um, our sort of existing developed areas where they can, it can accommodate um, some infill growth and where infrastructure may exist to support new residential development, commercial development, et cetera. So really all we're trying to do is for, even before the, the place types, existed for you know, the last 25 years is try to direct growth to areas um, which where existing activity occurs, there's commercial activity, there's um, residences, a lot of you know good interaction between um, uh, residents and, and visitors and and support those areas um, in a variety of ways to take the pressure off of our natural areas so that we can continue to have those um, providing the functions that they provide, the, um, the ecosystem services that we all benefit from, the carbon storage, the cleaning of air and water, habitat, um, et cetera. Those are, that's sort of a critical part of, of what we do. And this is our newest attempt at meeting, at trying to get to that Holy Grail. Um, <laughs> so, um, when is this tool going to be live? So to the public. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so we are. We definitely have to go live by June. No later than that. Um, we are trying to schedule with the town of Barnesville their pilot workshop as we speak for hopefully March, April. And so it looks like it should be sooner. So I will say April, but definitely a April, June. April to June. April to June. <laughs> and will I be able to go on the tool and look at what the projected sea level rise is for my neighborhood five years from now, when 10 years from now? We actually weren't going back and forth about this um, with the tool. So instead of attaching a specific sea level rise to a time frame, we just left it so that it would be whatever the sea level rise is um, from zero to six feet. So if you look at the graph like Heather shared and you see that in five years you can predict about two feet, which is a lot, um, you can just turn on the two feet sea level rise instead. So it's not necessarily a short term, it is a longer term planning, but it sort of takes out the element of like, well, by 2040, we're definitely going to see X, Y, Z. We don't want to do that. So instead, we just have the sea level rise options. Well, I'm, I'm 67, you know, I'm, I plan on living for the next 15 years, so I'm really sort of focused on those 15 right now, and I'm trying to understand <laughs> what we're, what we're doing with that. Is there, is there a tool any place that I can go and specifically look at that? Uh, not, that I'm, not that I'm not concerned about 2100. It, I stay awake nights thinking about it, but you know, we're just, sure. am I gonna have to sell my house next week? I mean, what's the deal here? <laughs> um, some of what Heather presented, um, and you can 
chime in if you want, but I'll just say that a lot of uh, what Heather presented and a, and a lot of additional information. Um, we had Greg Berman, who's a coastal geologist, a, um, a specialist with the uh, Woods Hole Sea Grant and Cape Cod Cooperative Extension, present a lot of the information related to sea level rise and other hazards to uh, the stakeholder groups. All of the stakeholder group information is available on our website. It's capecodcommission.org slash resilient Cape Cod. In that is greater detail on what the different sea level rise scenarios may be. And so the reason, as Jen su suggested, that we didn't put a time frame associated with it is because there's so much variability. But you could look at that information, we could point you directly to it, um, and make the assumption for yourself whether you want to look at the low, high, or intermediate scenarios. Okay, but just to give me a, a general idea of yeah. fi five years from now, are we looking at three inches or are we looking at Two feet? What, what are we looking at five years from now? Depends what you ask. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I think that we've been, yeah, we've been talking about um, two, feet, two feet over the next 50 years. Okay, so I'd, I'd rather so have it. You can divide that into years and, you know, get two inches. <laughs> um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? On March 12th, is that open to the public to participate? So, what I understand is um, the, the March 12th workshop is something that um, Hillary Lemos is um, coordinating with the town of Truro. It's actually a joint workshop between Wellfleet and Truro. It will be an all-day event. You need to commit to 8 to 4. Um, I think there will be food. <laughs> and um, you, you should contact Hillary um, or Emily Beebe in Truro. Um, if you'd like to participate. And I think they want to sign people up and make sure that they know who is coming and you know that they have commitments from people so that um, we can sort of plan for it. Uh, some of us will be there facilitating the workshop as well. That's part of our, our role in this planning process. Um, so it's not like open to the public like anyone can just come and show up at the last minute. They want a commitment in, in, in advance so that we, they can do a little bit of planning. Is there anyone else? Um, I'm just wondering about bridges. <laughs> when we look at all the flooding, and you know, we're laughing about it, but it, there's also part of me that's kind of panicked uh, as I look at that. And I, I'm wondering who's in charge of making that happen? Because you're talking about a lot of studying and thinking, but I'm wondering who's going to take action on bridges? Are there specific bridges you have in mind? Well, how about the Orleans Rotary? Okay, right. For okay, so let's start with that. Um, so there is a, um, an entity, um, two entities, um, that are part of county government. There's the Joint Transportation Council, which is made up of a representative from each town. And typically your DPW director is um, represented on that council. And they talk about priorities for um, various, pretty much transportation related projects. Um, and through a process that I can't speak to absolutely accurately, but those projects all get sort of um, directed up to the MPO, which is um, another regional entity, uh, including state representatives, that um, basically makes funding priorities for transportation projects. So through sort of a, a collective effort, um, towns are, through their DPW directors, um, identifying their priorities for action and getting them on what's called the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Plan. plan. Thank you. Um, for, for action in the future. And the TIP you know, plans out 10 years. These, these um, transportation projects are a long time in development. 
So um, everyone's got Orleans Rotary on their mind. That, yeah, that's, that one's not going to go um, unaddressed. So who do we write to if we want to encourage them to move quickly? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would I would start with your town staff, you know, uh, stand, send um, a request to either through your selectmen to um, the DPW director, or if you talk to DPW in one of these settings, you know, say I really feel strongly about the Orleans Rotary. Um, you could also send comments to Steve Tupper at the Cape Cod Commission. He's our um, transportation program manager, Steve Tupper. Thanks, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the regional transportation plan is actually in development right now. So we, just like the RPP, um, we, uh, the, the regional transportation plan is updated every five years. And so they're working on that right now. They just wrapped up um, public listening sessions. I think they had uh, three of them across the region. Um, like Heather, I also don't know all the details about this, but um, we're, I believe it's due to the state in June, end of June, and so there would be a public comment period prior to that. Um, but I believe there's also a survey that is open right now um, through March 6th that's available on our website uh, where you can actually go in and, and pinpoint some of the areas that you're concerned about. So you could go in, it's a map-based exercise as well as a survey. You can drop a pin on some of the areas bridges, other roadways, identify what your concern is there. Um, but then you can also complete a survey that talks about kind of your, um, you know, your, your broader concerns or what you think that the regional transportation plan should prioritize. And so there's a series of questions there. I think they said it should take you no more than 10 minutes, so. I'd like to make a comment about sea level rise. Sea level rise is totally unimportant. When Hurricane Sandy hit, and a 14-foot storm surge hit the Jersey Shore, the two inches of sea level rise in the last year was unnoticeable, or the last 100 years was unnoticeable. The real problem is storm surge. We see in the Gulf Coast, 1,000-year storms are happening every 10 years. 100-year storms are happening twice a summer. So it's the frequency and the severity of storms that matters, but we have no metric for it, so we talk about it in terms of sea level rise. But it isn't the water level going up on average, it's the, the peaks of the storms. So if we had a 14-foot sea surge, that's what we're going to remember, the fact that a week and a half later, the storm, the average sea level is maybe a, an inch or two higher than it was 50 years ago, doesn't matter. It's the storm surge that matters. And once the storm floods the downtown and recedes, we don't care if it's back two inches higher. Uh, I'm looking around and noticing uh, the, the age level of people here. Um, and, you know, some of us actually think, well, I have this many years, so I don't need to worry as much. But when I, what I w wonder is whether you are in any way involving the high school students of Cape Cod, because they're the ones that, A, can manage to work these tools, <laughs> uh, and B, will be here to, to uh, activate some of them. <laughs> I think, well, I just, okay. I mean, you want to tell your storm surge story? I just want to <laughs> add a, a comment, if I could. Um, it's often the case that mitigation plans and adaptation plans are combined into a sustainability plan. This is commonly done. The reason for that is there's overlap. So it's important not to think of them as two separate areas entirely. If you do mitigation that includes local renewable energy generation, storage, microgrids, et cetera, that is a form of adaptation. So there's a, there are two big circles and they overlap. And so at the end of the day, if we could pull together a sustainability plan for the Cape 
and that's a big load on you guys and others. That's probably what we have to do and not by redoing a plan every five years. We have maybe 10 years to do some really amazing things. Do the things, not plan for them. And that's not a criticism, that's just a fact about where we are. Um, I did want to mention um, one thing about the tool. So we, after the Barnstable pilot um, and their MVP process, we do um, need to develop a more robust outreach plan. So um, I really appreciate your idea of integrating high school students and younger students. If you have any other ideas of places we can give presentations or um, any other organizations that might um, benefit from a talk like this, please let us know. Um, that will be going on long term. So thank you for that. <laughs> I'll just add to that too. Um, engaging the younger generation has come up um, as we've talked with communities about their municipal vulnerability planning process. I was in a conversation just earlier this week where we've um, started talking about a way to engage the technical high schools um, on, in the region. This was specific to Bourne, but it's come up um, you know, a comment very similar to yours has come up in a number of meetings. Um, but engaging them in the MVP planning process, um, at, you know, getting the schools to um, allow students to participate in those for a day or a half day or, or a couple of sessions um, and try to do some outreach to the schools directly. And the technical schools have been the ones that have initially been identified, but it's definitely something that has come up and that, you know, I think at least through the MVP process and then in the future, as Jen suggested, thinking about other ways to get them involved. Glad that David David mentioned overlap. I've been thinking about solving our parking problem in Wellfleet, and thought about put, starting to build a bridge now that perhaps could hold cars either above on the bridge or below the bridge, and use the other uh, road just to be part of 6A or six, Route Six. And I'm wondering, since we have three brilliant people here, if you could comment on that. How, who do you go to? The you know, highway department, uh, uh, conservation resources, et cetera. So before you sit down, I think maybe you need to clarify a little bit. Um, you're interested in in a bridge that would be used in emergency situations, but in the non-emergency situations, you could use as parking. Is that what right you're Right now, in the next few months, we I have something saying. for parking. Got and it. And if there's an emergency, no one's going to be at the beach. You know, <laughs> we'll have a way to get out. It's an interesting idea. Um, I think that's something that, um, yeah, you'd want to talk about through your your town, um, because I think at, at a starting point, it's it's people's um, comfortability with that concept, because um, that would really change your experience of that part of Wellfleet, right? You know how you move through the community, um, and depending on where it was located, view sheds might be affected, and that kind of thing. So maybe a topic for a future forum. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but, um, and then, you know, you get some momentum in the community, then, you know, you can take that forward. That sounds like it, it could be, I don't know, yeah, that's a hybrid kind of project, not necessarily a transportation project, but interesting. It sounds a little like to me when I, I was listening to a story about New York, and New York will, you know, after Sandy, they saw that a lot of the buildings were underneath, so they were thinking of, um, Venice, so there will be a certain point where there'll be high rises mm -hmm. uh, underwater, so you have to move all the equipment up on top, all of the uh, electrical HVAC. and all of that, and you'll have bridges um, connecting buildings, you know, walkways, and um, ferries, you know, little gondolas of American style, New York style gondolas. But I think Olga, Olga's talked about this, and I think that she should uh, do it, she's a good architect, and she should, um, do a little rendering and give, so we can conceptualize this and then we can go from there. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, 
You said that you were interested in thoughts about how to kind of disseminate, use it. I mean, because it kind of sounds, at first it sounded to me like you were going to do the pilot with Barnstable and then the grant ends. You know, <laughs> and then in what? In terms of the grant, yes. Yeah, yeah right. And so um, in terms of enabling those of us in this community to use what you've developed, and I assume there's all this data already in there about the value of the infrastructure and everything in Wellfleet. I mean, I think it would be useful once people have had a chance to fiddle around with the tool and maybe be successful or maybe get really frustrated, you know, to actually have kind of a, a little hands-on workshop where people can bring their laptops and you can kind of go through in a much, so then, you know, everybody who's interested in their particular neighborhood, you know, could get a chance to get some on-site help. Thank you. Yeah, we, we did envision, so I had mentioned when I went through the tool that we were not intending this to be an engineering tool. We had a, a, a serious concern that, you know, people would say, the commission says that we should put <laughs> such and such in front of my house, so why don't you let me? Uh, excuse me. So we did um, sort of envision initially that we'd be able to train um, planning staff um, at, at, the, at the least. Um, to be able to use this tool to enable conversations on coastal resiliency um, at that level. So we were thinking about trainings, um, and as part of the stakeholder process, we did also have a group of um, stakeholders that work uh, very closely with um, GIS-based data or tools or something where they've kind of engaged this process before. We call them the tools group. And they were sort of our guinea pigs for a few different iterations of this tool. So um, it, it would be good to bring that group um, together again to talk about um, what the output was. You could also train trainers. Yep. You know, you could get t people from, um, and there, I think there'd be very enthusiastic people that are right here in this room that would want to really be able to manipulate that tool and be able to share it with others. And, you know, we could, I could see workshops happening at the library and that sort of thing. I first, I'd like to thank you for both the presentation and for all the work you've done over the years. I think this is going to be a very useful uh, tool. For those of us who don't know anything about the uh, Cape Cod Commission, could you just say a little more about what it is, who's on it, how people are chosen, and whether or not you have any actual power as opposed to um, <laughs> I hear you. Uh, advisory? <laughs> Um, I'll start, but either of my coworkers can jump in. Um, so the Cape Cod Commission was established in 1990 um, through the Cape Cod Commission Act. And the idea was that, um, especially in the 1980s, there was a lot of development and there was a lot of people concerned about what kind of impacts those there were going to be long term on Cape Cod's uh, environment. Um, so broadly speaking, we have two sort of um, main focuses. One is planning and one is regulatory. I work on the planning side and probably can speak to that better, but we have a broad range of um, staff. There's 36 people on staff and we are working very closely with the towns um, on a regional level to sort of make sure that we are what we're calling keeping a special place special. So making sure that we're balancing um, that natural environment with the built environment, as you can see in the Cape Cod place types. So that is um, one component. And then the other component is the regulatory um, side of Cape Cod Commission. So we have um, three or four people on staff that when there is what's called a, a DRI, a development of regional impact, um, they either are referred to us through the towns, if a town is concerned about the larger scale impacts of a development, or if they trip specific thresholds, um, if they're over a certain size, or if there's a certain number of housing units, then they go through um, an intensive review process where we sort of determine um, what we think those potential impacts of the DRI would be, and they're either approved or denied. Um, and we also have a Cape Cod Commission board, so there are elected officials, or appointed, um, for each of the towns. There's a representative from each, um, including uh, a Wampanoag re uh, representative, a um, state, and then a county, and I should probably know all of these, and a minority leader. Um, so those uh, are the people who vote um, to approve or deny a GRI. In a nutshell, I think I did okay. <laughs> and I believe Roger Putnam is still our representative. 
uh, th who has been appointed here. I want to thank you, and I am going to um, I'm going to send out a article just to sort of underline um, a little bit more of what the commission can and cannot do. But we are lucky that they they are one of the only planning they are the only planning board, I believe, in the state of Massachusetts with regulatory powers yeah, that has some authorities. And yes, and in Martha's Vineyard, uh, and they, that wasn't always the case, I don't think, but it came on. They were first. And then okay, then we then. then, we, then yep. And it really was created by, um, you know, it was pushed by uh, Senator O'Leary at that time because he saw the development and, you know, I think the pushback on the residential development is was real estate development people. So unfortunately, they, they probably, there was had to be a, a give and take there. But um, I, some of you will remember the Lowe's project uh, that was gonna be built in Dennis, which wouldn't have, it would have had a environmental impact but it would have had a community character impact, and it would have had an impact on local businesses, which was a community impact. And um, I still have, and I will retrieve it, a, an article that was that I found in the Huffington Post that talked about the um, look what look what Cape Cod has, and every every town or every region across America should have such a tool because instead of a big box coming in and being able to just you know, throw their weight and their money and their power, uh, this community was able to say no. And it, and it was denied, that project was denied. And there was a lot of uh, fight on that and I was very involved uh, at that time. So um, there is a true benefit to the commission. I do think that their times are changing and you're gonna have to um, get into, into areas that, that you always haven't gotten into, but um, a lot of the information pertaining to Wellfleet has already been covered through the Herring River restoration. And that is one of those mitigating uh, solutions. You know, it's, you can look at that as mitigating uh, against some of these hazards, uh, even though there's some people don't get that picture. But I would go back and look at the information from that if you wanna see uh, local, um, right now, real time local flooding uh, areas and what's predicted for wealthy. If there are no more, thank you. Now there is a part two, and I did say that we are, I think a lot of people understood, and we are going to get a little bit into the mitigation. Let me get up here. So, you know, there's, you still have to do something, and uh, our town is embracing uh, doing something and mitigating what, and, and taking action where we can. So part two of this is going to be with um, Dick Elkin and um, David F Fox Mead, I believe. But it's going to be all right. It's going to be mainly mainly um, Dick. But I do want to remind people that if you would, if I will pass this notebook around, and if you would like to have more information or be on the email list for the commission, they will send you the information as they have it. And I do want to thank them. So I want to thank everyone for being here. This being well fleet, we're naturally two or three years ahead of the rest of everyone. And so we're in, 19, in 2016, we drafted the local comprehensive plan. It's still a draft, but we're following it. I looked at the local comprehensive plan and it said we're going to do certain things. And I said, that's great. There are two sections, one on energy and one on climate change. We knew who was doing the energy, but we didn't know who was doing the climate change. When we looked at the climate change, there was a large overlap with what the energy committee was doing, in, which was mitigation. Um, so we said, no one else is doing the rest. Maybe we should sign up for that. We talked about it. We have a lot of people who are active. And we said, we're going to propose to the select board that we change our charge, not charter, but charge, um, so that we can take this on. Um, many of you signed the petition last Saturday. Uh, it's interesting that we've had so many meetings about climate change and wealth fleet, which is why we have such a high level of interest. So let's get practical. I'm going to read to you what we wrote 
couple of weeks ago, and you'll see how irrelevant it is to what we've heard today. We were asking that the change to the charge be that the this new Energy and Climate Change Committee will prepare, coordinate, and execute mitigation actions and adaptation strategies. Does that sound familiar? In response to climate change. Um, we're going to coordinate with various town committees, and originally we, I had the Conservation Commission, because they are the ones who have been planning, as I've learned, with this um, meeting on the 13th, in March 13th, they've been carrying the ball in planning. We have not been planning for adaptation. Again, let's talk about mitigation and adaptation. When we do solar PV, that's mitigation. We're reducing the amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere, and that will have an effect in 30 years, and maybe our sea level rise will be three feet instead of two, four feet in 30 years. But we are saying what we're changing our charge to be is adaptation, because there's something that needs to happen in the near term. There are a lot of things that are happening, but we didn't see anyone who was willing to say, we're going to coordinate it and lead the charge and manage whatever we all collectively decide to do. And that's what we felt there was a gap, and that's why we're asking. We want to do something. We don't necessarily want to say we have all the ideas. Now, the original plan was to submit this as an article for town meeting, mostly because that would get people talking about it and we could learn something, because we need to learn who is getting involved. And I've learned tonight and I've learned over the course of the events that the, National Resor the Natural Resources Advisory Board is playing a role. The Board of Health is definitely playing a role. The Conservation Commission, the Friends of the Herring River are playing a role, and of course the Shellfish Advisory Board. Now we know the Shellfish Advisory Board is a very good handle on what is going on with shellfishing, and we could not begin to contribute more to that, but we certainly need to make sure everything is coordinated. So we need to create liaisons. Some member from our committee will go to their meetings, some member from their committee will come to our meetings when it's appropriate, because we have to act together and we have to act. When we adopt a plan, somebody's got to make it carry through, and that's what we're proposing to do create a group who can take action. Um, our committee is probably capable of doing that, and so that's the plan. Um, so I ask for your support, and I ask for your support. Maybe we won't go to town meeting, maybe we'll just ask for a charter change, a charge change for the select board, but we would like to start acting. We have this new wonderful tool that will help us decide on specific actions, but we have to start taking specific actions. We don't want to just attend meetings and exhort each other to do something, okay? We want to actually do something ourselves now, and so that's what this charge change is all about. Any questions? Danny. Would you imagine that this would uh, continue to be an advisory committee or would you be a regulatory committee? It's not a regulatory committee that has a board and jurisdiction. It is the charge is to change to the charge is to formulate and advance mitigation and adaptation strategies as outlined in the comprehensive plan. So the plan sets the guidance and we will just implement what the plan calls for. But would, also, you, would you be implementing themselves or would you be making recommendations to the select board to? To me, to, implementation means you go out and you get a grant, you get all the departments to plan what you need to do, departments and boards, you go out and get a grant, and then the administration tends to implement these things. Does that answer the question? We're not a regulatory board. We're not ruling on what anybody should do we are trying to get 
plans in place we all agree on, get the funding in place and work on that, and then project manage it when we get the grant, if we get the grant. Okay. Um, Sheila. I just want to, um, I want to support um, Dick and, and um, this group's effort in saying that in the beginning of uh, the Cape Cod Commission's talk, they were talking about how we just had a hazard mitigation uh, plan approved, which made us eligible for grants. And grants create action, you know, so it, it is time for action. The money is, it, it's dangling there. It's two years ago that we were awarded this. It's a five year, you know, window. And what have we done? Not much. So I want to support Dick in this and say that, you know, now is time for action. Uh, there's plans there. We can pick what the low hanging fruit and go, and go beyond. And there's money, if we can make that argument, the money is there to help us. So part of the problem is we don't think we have all the expertise by any means in carrying this out. We're going to need a lot of help. Obviously, help writing grants and knowing where the money is is one of the specialties we'll need. We'll recruit Sheila. Any other questions? Um, David, do you have anything? No? Okay. If anyone wants to contribute, we're not saying we have all the answers. Please. We, we're going to need to expand the committee. We're going to need help, but we want people not to just say, here's what we think somebody else should do. We want to get started doing it. Thank you. Um, I just sort of uh, related to that, and one other thing that um, we sort of meant to, to um, comment on or advise you about is a project that's happening in Wellfleet um, that's, uh, it's sort of in the midst of, of wrapping up. So um, the Conservation Commission, your Conservation Commission wanted to change its wetlands, the wetland bylaw here in town and wetland regulations. And so they sought um, grant monies through the Cape Cod Commission, we sort of direct state funds from um, Department of Housing and Community Development, State Department of Housing and Community Development. We direct those funds to worthy projects in our communities and Wellfleet came forward with this proposal to change the wetlands bylaw. By um, the town uh, engaged the Association to Preserve Cape Cod to analyze your bylaw and make some recommendations. And from what I understand, um, the Conservation Commission is carrying those recommendations forward. Um, I don't know whether a uh, bylaw change will um, be going to town meeting at this time, but um, I know that they are looking at some changes that would help address um, better management of the coastline specifically and address some of these resiliency issues. So this is one of those immediate responses, um, one of your town boards is, is trying to take some action to better address development um, within uh, wetland resource areas. And, and with that, I just want to say that uh, the commission is there to um, give information if they can't assist and they can help direct. And they are um, an amazing group of people, as you can see, and they have a lot to think about and a lot to deal with, but they are there with technical assistance uh, for towns. They're there for um, guidance, direction, and information gathering. So they are a huge resource. I thank you for being here tonight and for all you do. And um, let's, let's utilize them, and I think that we can um, you know, really take a look at this, look at what is facing us. I, I think that what we saw is, is pretty scary. We should be scared. Uh, and disappointed in ourselves because we've all sort of been, you know, kind of still going on with that conversation because it wasn't so immediate. But living here um, really does kind of bring it all home. And just one other thing, and like, let me see if I have this wrong, but um, when we were a part of this stakeholder uh, group, it started off with a film and it was a man, um, you know, probably in his late 60s, early 70s, and he's with a baseball cap and he's you know, kind of throwing the ball into his glove. And, you know, it's this beautiful day, and they pull pull away, and he's up to his waist, up to hip waist here. 
in water. And he said, this used to be a uh, home plate when I was a boy. And it was in Louisiana. And Louisiana has lost as much land as the state of Delaware or Maryland. Or, but it's a huge, a huge part of Louisiana is gone. And now they're trying to figure out where, what they're going to let go what can they save and you know and what what can they invest in and what towns are they going to let go because they can see it in the future so it is here it is real and it's time for us to take action and stop talking so with that i want to thank everybody who came tonight and um, anyone who's listening in the television audience uh, you you know who everyone is in this room so um, partner up and we should get going and thank you again it was a great discussion <laughs> <laughs>